Yeah, it's been sad. Um, you came out of your of your mom, start banging with spoons. Yeah, you got that right. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you you had really interesting parents. Uh, your, your father. I still do. They're, uh, they're still alive. I'm oh, sorry. Actually, yeah, Happy Father's Day. I need to call them. Oh, there you yeah, go. There you go. But it's like 7 a.m. in the states right now. So. Oh, okay. How was it? Was your father a good storyteller, telling stories about, let's I, say, Frank yeah. Sinatra? My my dad's a jokester, so he always had the book of jokes, and he was always telling jokes. My mom used to stop him halfway through the joke. He's heard that one already. He knows that joke. <laughs> the constantly telling jokes. Um, always thinks he's got a punchline. Always laughing at himself. You know? But uh, I mean, I was there for a lot of his stories, other than when he was in the clubs, or whatever. But uh, yeah, the stories are never ending. It goes on and on and on and on. So. But, but you also did work together. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, it's funny. I don't know if, if you know over here there was a singer, a jazz singer named Pearl Bailey, and Pearl Bailey worked with my dad. Uh, was married to Louis Belson, and so my. Dad worked with Louis Belson, so they were friends. And I was hanging out with them one day, and Pearl Bailey put me up on her lap, and she gave me my first uh, piece of chewing gum. So that was like I was hanging out with Louis Belson and Pearl Bailey, and they were teaching me how to chew gum. So that's like my my upbringing. It's just, yeah. Which is interesting, I guess. <laughs> oh, oh well, yeah, because you traveled a lot, you met a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah, my parents started moving me when I was like seven. We moved from the Boston area down to Florida. And then they moved consecutively, like every two years we moved. So uh, I was used to traveling. I have never really been that person that was afraid to leave their town. I was always up and moving, up and moving, up and moving. So That's good for a rock musician. Yeah, I'm used to it. It's, it's my life. Being on the road is my life. It's just... Then your parents bought a theater in in uh, Orlando. Oh, yes, yeah. And you, you you were drumming in the pit. They had a yeah they had a they had a theater they were working down in Boss uh, Bar Boca Raton in Florida, and uh, that's when I I was working down there, and they decided they were gonna open their own place in Orlando. We moved up to Orlando, and uh, I consequently being that I thought I'd inherit the theater, so I worked 24-7 for the theater. And uh, on top of, I, I did everything from ticket sales to waiting tables to, I ended up being the drummer for the theater. So I would play drums, I had a keyboard set, okay. sorry, a keyboard set up to me so I could, I could play drums and hit little, uh, you know, bell parts and extra little piano parts that, that needed to be put into the song. Yeah, I always said that was funny because I went from doing I played the Antichrist Superstar. Yeah. And then a couple of years later, I was touring with. Uh, no, sorry. Your first Jesus Christ Superstar. Oh, Jesus Christ Superstar, yeah. right? And then a couple of years later, I'm touring with Antichrist Superstar. So <laughs> it was kind of a funny. That that really is funny, man. <laughs> but how was it then? You did your own stuff in between. Uh, in between the, uh, the theater stuff. Yeah. Um, I mean, you were in bands, or yeah, they they actually up and moved again. So that was they opened the theater when I was uh, I was around 20 when they opened the theater, and I played up there. And my girlfriend and I worked and lived at the theater pretty much. And they decided um, they were going back to Vegas, so the, the theater fell apart after a year or so, whatever, it fell apart, they went back to Vegas, oh, okay. and I said, well, I'm staying here with my girlfriend, so we stayed in Florida, and I just started consecutively working in the, the bars, playing in the, the cover bands, huh. and uh, I did that for, I did that for about a year and a half, two years, till I, I actually got a fist fight on stage a Friday night, and I was on a brawl with the keyboard player in the band, so uh, I got blackballed in Florida, so... Here I am, a musician in Florida. I can't work because I beat the hell out of my keyboard player <laughs> on a Friday night, packed dance floor. And the bass player is like running the lights with his foot. And all of a sudden, I'm like, bang, bang, boom, boom, beating the shit out of the keyboard player. And the bass player just hits the lights off, black, blackout. So, and it was that was that. So uh, I wouldn't, I waited, uh, I was, well, I tried to wait tables, but my hair was too long. I valet parked. And then eventually I said, all right, I'll go back to college. So I moved back to Vegas to uh, go to UNLV for music. Oh, yeah. What is not, it? not for long. Uh, not for long. Not for long, yeah. no. I was, in, I was in session in UNLV, and I was listening to these fat teachers tell me how to be, be entertainers. And 
it just aggravated me. I'm like, you're not an entertainer. You can't get on stage and perform for people, and you're telling me how to do it. Yeah. And I'd always get a phone call, hey, you want to join our band? Want to join band? So I would go out and join bands. So I go into college, and then I go work, and then I go back into college, and then work. And it was just like, you know what? Being in college for me is just not the way to go right now. Yeah. You know, unless I was, you know, which I could not qualify for. If I was going to go to Berkeley or Juilliard or a school that was very prestigious for music. That would have been very good, but at the time, the school and ULV and stuff, the, the teachers was horrendous. So I made a living at just playing, which, oh, okay. you know. What, what did your parents say when you got the gig at, uh, with Manson? Um, that's a good question. I have to say, I don't know. That's a good question. Because I was actually, I was actually in Vegas when I got the call. Um, So hey, I'm gonna fly out, meet this band, and uh, I flew out, met him, came back, picked up my drums, and joined the band. And I mean, I, I guess they they was you know good for you. You earned some money. Yeah, yeah. because I, I was on unemployment at the time, so it was like you know, you gotta go follow your dream, go do it, and stuff like that. So. Yeah. Well, and then this incident in New York where, where you got hit with the mic stand. Oh, yeah. New, York <laughs> oh. always, New York has always been I said a hotbed for my injuries. <laughs> like the, the first one being obviously the infamous nothing nothing night, you yeah. know, night of nothing yeah. with Trent. Oh, man. And that was, you know, it was, it was Trent's, it was it was a ton of bands on Trent's label all playing at Irvine, which is this tiny little theater in yeah. New York. And uh You've got all these bands, so Manson being one of the early bands, there wasn't that much room on stage, and the drums weren't on a riser. Mm -hmm. So I'm pretty much playing, looking at Manson, you know, his ass is right there, and anytime he moved, you know, things got bumped into. So uh, when it got further and further into the show, it just being very punk rock, breaking stuff and wrecking stuff or whatever, and uh, further in the show or whatever, he turned around and he, and he threw the mic and it went over the drums. Instead of going into the drums, it went over the drums and I turned my head real fast and it bashed me in the side of the head. The, the, uh, an inside story about that, which is really funny or whatever, was that uh, the stories got so blown up and so blown up and so blown up and Manson was like, the stories are so much better than the video. Because he has vi yeah, videotape of it actually happening. It's like, ah, uh, that happened. Yeah, it does not. Nah, it doesn't yeah. look like much or whatever. You know, it's like let the stories fly. And and for many, many, many years, the stories were just out there. Now you can YouTube it and it's there. Yeah. You know, you can see it. But it, it wasn't. It was just the the sound of it sounded so much greater than it really was. And then, uh, I mean, same thing. We were back in New York a few years later, uh, playing Hammersmith Ballroom, I think. And Manson was wrecking my drums every night. My tech was sick of it. My tech was like, no more destroying the drums. I'm not putting them together. I'm not fixing them. And Manson wrecks the drums. My tech decides this night he's going to strap all the drums down, bolt them down. There's no way Manson's going to move any of it. And. At the end of the show, Manson grabs my drums and he's pulling on them and they won't move. And he's, rah, and he's shaking them. And uh, 
he's yelling at me. These drums, <laughs> these drums better fall over. You know, so I'm pushing on the drums and he's pulling on them, and I'm pushing, 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 and he gives up. He's like, "Fuck it," and I'm pushing it. He gives up and he walks away. And like two feet away, the straps snapped. And I went flying off the drum riser like like a slingshot. I went flying up over the riser, boom, landed on the ground and broke my collarbone. So, uh, and that was like we had we had a show two days later in Chicago. So, uh, went to the doctors. They're like, "Well, your collarbone's broke." They they put me in a sling and they said, "Now don't move your arm for six weeks." I'm like, "Well, I got I got a show tomorrow, so that's obviously not going to happen." So it ended up being I would play the show. I took my hi-hat from being a left-handed drummer. I took my hi-hat and I moved it over to the left side so I could just kind of play with my wrist. And I did all my fills with one hand. Shit. So I ended up going from this. To, I turned into a right-handed player, basically, uh, using my left foot. And then uh, I'm sure I did a lot of damage to myself because I just never let myself heal. Yeah. And I've gone through physical therapy and I've... You know, you go through the whole stretching and all that kind of stuff, but it is what it is. I can't, I can't change it at this point, and I, yeah. I can't afford, you know, hundred thousand well, dollars surgery to fix it. You, you see, uh, of course, that it reminds me of Def Leppard's drummer. You yeah, know, I love. I got, got to hand it to him. I feel, and all the guys are the, the greatest guys in the world. To they took the downtime, they let the drummer recoup, and then they came back strong. Yeah. And uh, I love the guys for it. I mean. When it comes down to uh, bands that sick by their drummer because there's so many that don't, uh, there's nothing greater to me than see a band, and uh, it was it was a, a triumph for the for the drummer to to get through that, but for the band itself yeah. to go through it or whatever, yeah. and I I love them to death for that, and I see them and I I'll tell them all the time I. I love you to death for doing this. I said the same thing to Steven Tyler the other day. I was hanging out with Steven Tyler, and I'm like, you know, I love that you stick by your drummer. You know, Joey's been there forever, and I just love that about people because I, I, it's just the, the music industry. They, you see bands that go through 10 different drummers, 12 different drummers, and it's a, uh, it's disheartening being a drummer. You know, Rob was joking about that. He was talking the other day, and he was thinking about like people in the band and. <laughs> And he's like, no more drummers, I'm done. I was like, I don't want to play with anybody else, so hopefully I won't die anytime soon. You know, it just becomes spinal tap after that. You know, the drummer's dead, the drummer's this, the drummer blows oh, up. Yeah. It's just ridiculous, so. <laughs> um, yeah, speaking of drummers, um, and, and since they're headlining tonight, Black Sabbath, just explain what impact Bill Ward has for Black Sabbath music. I, I love Bill Ward so much, and I did the very first Ozfest, and I talked to Drum Magazine, and I was like, hey, I'm going to maybe do an interview with those drummers, I'll do an article. And I did a 16-page article, and I took all the photos on Ozfest of all the drummers, and I turned it into Drum Magazine. They, they edited it down to about seven pages, uh, but it ended up being like the laugh The last paragraph was a full ode to Bill Ward, you know, saying, you know, Black Sabbath just isn't Black Sabbath without Bill Ward, you know, and every drummer's heart that out here on Ozfest, the heart goes out to Bill Ward, long live Bill Ward. And I just, I paid so much respect to him at that point. And then a couple years later, we did Ozfest. We did, well, we did the second Ozfest was with Ozzy, not Sabbath, and he had Puffy playing drums. Oh, yeah. And then the following year, we, we, the third time I did Ozfest, it was Black Sabbath with Bill Ward. And I sat down with Bill Ward and I told him about the article and I actually gave him the article. And we sat and we had lunch and just chilled and talked and, and it was the greatest feeling in the world to be able to hang out with, you know, yeah. icons that you grew up with. One other thing, uh, how is it working with the coming Cummings brothers, because you you did Power Man 5000 as well. Oh, well, you say the brothers. I mean, yeah. both. Yeah. Sp Spider's an old friend. As funny as that is, because uh, Power Man did the, one of the first tours I did with with Manson. Power Man was on the tour. Oh, I and, didn't know. Yeah. yeah. So it was uh, it was the first record or whatever, and they were out touring, opening for Manson. And I really got into it because it was very percussion oriented. They had a percussion player yeah. and a drummer, and it was all groove and stuff. And I became a fan then, and then 
you know, a little time goes by, whatever, and they were in the studio recording, and they're like, hey, you should come down and hang out with us, whatever, and I was hanging out in the studio, and they were working on a an end to the album, which was just like, Van Halen did like, thank you, boys, the end of their album. Yeah. So they're working on stuff, and they're like, Jim, do you want to play some piano? Because I'm a piano player. So I'm sitting on the piano, and they're like, we're going to do something like this. And uh, they just started jamming or whatever, and I started jamming along with them. And we're just playing, you know, and, you know, 15 minutes go by or something like that, and the producer walks in and goes, done, we got it. And I, I thought we were just trying to come up with ideas. And they just, the producer tracked it, I didn't even know he was, they were tracking. And then the Rob, I, I'd have known way back then because, you know, when they were touring with Pantera, we'd go backstage and hang out with, with them. Yeah. So I knew Rob and them from then. Um, and just always thought Rob and Sherry were just the nicest people in the world. Oh, so, yeah. so it's so amazing to, it's completely yin and yang. Like I would say the, the Manson camp is just completely fucked out of their minds yeah. all the time. Yeah. Party, 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 24 seven. It's kind of entertaining because you never know what's gonna happen. <laughs> it's just fucked up all the time. And the zombie camp are just completely down to earth, sane, everything's real, you know, like, and it is the, the coolest, I always, I refer to it always as, Manson, it was when you're a kid, you're a kid and you're partying, and, and there's a point in your life where you have to grow up. Yeah. So I always try to say that Manson was my youth, and when I had zombie, I had to become a man, I had to grow up, you know, and it's funny, it's just like I got married, everyone, everyone in the band's married, and it's very normal, so, uh, it's 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 such a great place to be, but it's completely different worlds. Yeah. Twig is sober now. Yeah. And he was a hard hardcore. You know, he could get he could get deep 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 into it or whatever, and it scared the hell out of everybody. Yeah. And uh, just one day, you know, he's just, you know, doctors are like you got to stop, and he stopped and he's been doing three four plus years now he's been totally straight and doing great yeah um so that's so great i mean every time i see twiggy i think he's more mature and more grown up and i mean i always thought he was the biggest asshole in the world so it's just so great to see him yeah. grow up i worry about manson as as in like a brother because i feel like he's stuck in that he's stuck in being Marilyn manson you know, and that's pleasing everyone else in the world and not watching out for yourself. Yeah. So I wouldn't be shocked when I get a phone call saying, you know, Manson's dead. Yeah. But well, well, I'm sure there's some record company executives waiting for that. <laughs> oh, I'm sure it's never ending. And I've I've said to myself, like back in the day, you've got the yes man, you've got people around him that just won't say shit. It's like do whatever you want, you know. They ain't gonna say shit because they don't get fired. Yeah. You know, just keep it all hush hush. I don't have to worry about that anymore. So it's like I want to go to him and say, dude, you know, you. But you can't really. I mean, people that try and change him just get axed out of the life. Yeah. You know, you've got you've got lawyers and managers and ex-wives and everyone saying you know you've got to do this you got to do that and oh you know what yeah. Fuck you. wife's gone you know lawyers are gone everyone it's just so I, I, you gotta say I love him like a brother and sometimes you love your brother sometimes you hate your brother you walk this weird line oh yeah so uh, what happens happens but nothing's gonna change it you know do you, do you see him once in a while uh, I talk to Manson once in a while. I, I mean, I, I just saw him at the Golden God Awards. Oh yeah. You know, because he's just there and stuff like that. Um, he just bought a new house that I haven't seen yet, but um, he's doing a great job and he's doing his thing and he's working. And, oh yeah. You know, he's he's great, but but I worry about him. One other thing, how's your Rottweiler? Oh, I love my Rottweiler. He's doing okay. I worry about him too. You be out on the road, or it's like a kid. You worry. You go out on the road or whatever, and yeah. they they. Uh, Next thing you know, they're dying or whatever. So I always thought that was my parents. I thought my parents are older and older and older or whatever, and they're gonna end up dying. I used to think, my I hate the thought that my parents are gonna watch Manson abuse me, and they're gonna die knowing that I was abused. So it, it makes them really, really happy to see me in a nice, loving atmosphere in the zombie oh, camp. Yeah. Um, and now the, the Rottweilers are worried. My Rottweiler, one, one is eight and one's like four. And Rottweilers only live to like 10, maybe 11, 12. Yeah, they're not, they're not getting that old, yeah. Yeah, mine is a little crazy. 
like the first one was crazy so when my wife wanted a second one we got a very mellow second one he's got a half rottweiler half german shepherd so he's tamer um but they get into it each other and i try to get in between them and i'll i'll end up with a big bite out of my back or my they bite my legs you know they i so um they bite neighbors my they just my dogs are, are scary and, I, and they're getting scary as time goes on they get older like the, the other day he just took just took a grab a hold of me and he, he grabbed me and he let it go and then grabbed it again I was like, <laughs> my my wife my wife had to run to the kitchen grab water and come and throw water on them to get them to let go of my hand you know it's just like i love my raw wallers but they're psycho they're crazy but Thanks for doing your research. You really, you know my life pretty well. Hi, this is Ginger Fish from Rob Zombie Band. We're at Nova Rock 2014, and you're listening to Nuva Chuck, Nuva Chuck. Um, the only TV you the need. The only TV you possibly could ever need. Excellent. I said the only TV you ever need. <laughs> Wonderful.